This brings us to campaigns for social justice. And once again, quoting one of our very quotable scholars, the social justice movement sought to aid exploited workers and the urban poor. The major organizations in this movement were led by women who demonstrated their concern as well as their administ administrative skills and leadership in efforts to abolish child labor, establish wage and hour laws for workers and ensure factory safety, alleviate poverty, and encourage respect for human rights. The women social workers who led this movement were assisted by social gospel clergy and a number of social scientists. So we see here kind of a combination uh, of groups we've been talking about. Social workers, Jane Addams, uh, uh, the beginning of that uh, field, social gospel clergy, and uh, some of the social scientists we talked about who we saw uh, much of the, the social scientists' uh, ugly side uh, as well. However, they were involved in some of these efforts. And here's yet another place where we can see, I think, the uh, social justice, uh, but the progressive movement at its best. Uh, uh, social justice expands uh, into other things uh, and a wider variety of causes later on. But here it's mainly a concern for uh, labor, uh, and uh, more specifically than that, child labor and, and women's labor. And in regard to the latter, a blockbuster Supreme Court case, Mueller v. Oregon, uh, bore directly on women's work. Uh, decided in 1908, uh, the, the issue was the hours of work and the conditions of work for women. The concern, of course, was that women uh, have uh, you know, do childbearing uh, and uh, that this could then negatively impact their health and affect the children, uh, you know, babies, and the larger society because of it. Uh, so this is about women's freedom to negotiate their own work hours, their own contracts, etc. And the case was quite controversial, even in the women's movement itself, because some women's activists and some women's rights leaders thought that we need this kind of legislation to protect women in the workplace. But others, and you can see how this, you know, could cut both ways, said, no, uh, this is uh, unfair, it's unjust, because men still get to contract and decide how many hours they want to work, if they need to work more, want to work more, they can, but now women, uh, if these laws are going to be passed, and this Supreme Court case, as Supreme Court cases uh, do, was deciding uh, uh, an earlier uh, uh, instance of this uh, in Oregon. So the Supreme Court is weighing in on this type of legislation already been passed in this case. But some activists, women's activists, said, no, 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 th this, is, this is not equality for women. This, this, this violates women's rights. Uh, a very influential brief was written by a guy who would later become a major figure on the Supreme Court, uh, at this point, a, a brilliant lawyer, Louis Brandeis. And the Brandeis brief, as it's known, was actually written uh, by Florence Kelly, uh, one of the uh, most important uh, women's union leaders at the time, uh, and a couple other women. Uh, and it was an extensive sort of uh, uh, data-based study uh, on uh, sociological evidence uh, that sort of was brought to bear to make the case that women were being harmed uh, by being worked too hard and you know, worked in uh, certain conditions that uh, hurt their health and, and possibly their, uh, again, childbearing. So Brandeis wrote the brief, but the research was done uh, by Kelly, a woman named Joseph uh, uh, Goldmark, and, and a couple others. Uh, the Unanimous opinion, uh, written by the Justice uh, David Brewer, uh, said the limitations uh, which this statute places upon her contractual powers, upon her right to agree with her employer as to the time she shall labor, are not imposed solely for her benefit, but also largely for the benefit of all. So the Supreme Court is saying that women need to be protected on the job, 
uh, not just because of them, because of their larger family responsibilities and child rearing and child raising responsibilities, which shows that in some ways, or maybe for the most part, the Supreme Court was thinking more about the health and well-being of the family as a whole and not about uh, women's, women, women's, uh, I was going to say women's right to choose, in this case, not uh, whether to have a baby, but to choose uh, how and when and, you know, for how long, under what conditions uh, they're going to go to work. As so often happens uh, in our society and other societies, reform happens after a tragedy. Not always, but uh, too often. In this case, the relevant tragedy that connects with social justice is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in Manhattan in the Garment District in 1911. Uh, women working on the 10th floor of a, basically a sweatshop, mostly uh, recently arrived immigrants of Jewish and Italian uh, background, had been locked in to the factory or uh, sweatshop by management who were afraid they were going to like steal stuff and walk outside, I don't know, take breaks, whatever it might be. Uh, an investigation uh, after the fact showed that the, the company uh, and uh, the an insurance company were actually to blame, though no charges were ever brought. Uh, 146 women killed, all of whom had, they, they had two choices, both of which ended in death. They could either jump to their deaths uh, out the 10-story uh, windows or uh, stay inside and die of smoke inhalation. On the left, you see a, a horrible picture of uh, women uh, on the sidewalk uh, having uh, chosen the option of, of jumping. So one way or another, uh, they all perished. The, poli the, the fire department didn't have ladders that went up that high in those days, and there weren't sprinklers, there weren't for the most part, if at all, uh, fire escapes outside. Uh, it's kind of like lattice work down the building. You don't, see, you don't see any of them there. So this is the kind of thing that was spurred by this great tragedy. As Professor Chambers says, the public outrage that resulted from the Triangle Fire led to the passage of a number of laws designed to increase factory safety standards and improve working conditions, especially for women and children. So uh, sadly, the, the cause of social justice better conditions for workers, workers' rights, concern for the humanity of workers, particularly women and children, was uh, moved along by this uh, event. The social gospel movements uh, and campaigns against vice. The social gospel element of the progressive movement was not just uh, about vice. Uh, so some of them were involved in uh, all of or most of the other issues we've talked about already, but vice was a particular concern, and it was one where the social gospel Protestant element in the social justice movement was more concerned with this issue than were the, as I called them before, the, the non-religious progressives, which isn't to say that they weren't religious, just that their religion didn't really inform their progressivism. Uh, and one of the major vices, just to give us uh, an example, uh, it was uh, alcohol, uh, according to uh, these reformers, believing that alcohol was a scourge and uh, uh, harming uh, American society uh, and uh, American, American values. So this is what actually led to prohibition. We think of prohibition... Uh, as having to do with the 1920s, because that's when it went into effect, the dry decade, which we're going uh, going to get to soon. But uh, it's the progressives uh, that uh, did the groundwork, the legwork, uh, to put that uh, issue uh, sort of uh, you know f front and center in American politics, which led to the amendment uh, illegalizing the sale and transport of alcohol. Uh, one of the most colorful figures in this lecture uh, was uh, a Bible-thumping woman from Kansas uh, whose crusade was to combat uh, alcohol consumption named Carrie Nation. Uh, and uh, you see an axe in her right hand and a Bible in her left hand. 
uh, she said famously, see at the bottom, I'm a bulldog running along at the feet of Jesus, barking at what he doesn't like. Uh, so uh, why did she have an axe? Well, first of all, if I saw a woman coming down the street uh, uh, towards me with a Bible in one hand and an axe in the other, I'd cross to the other side. Uh, and she looks a little bit uh, uh, scary uh, as well, like you don't want to tangle with her. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, but the axe, uh, that kind of tells you what her tactics were for fighting uh, alcohol uh, consumption. She uh, and followers would go into bars and saloons unannounced uh, and uh, sometimes even politely tell the proprietor or manager or owner, uh, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to hurt you. Uh, but uh, I'm here to let you know that you need to get out of the way because we're going to smash up your bar, or bottles of vodka and you know, whiskey, whatever else it is. And they would. And they'd often get arrested, of course. But she quickly became kind of a national popular hero, seen at least not by all Americans, certainly not by the the bar owners, but as a uh, uh, somebody doing uh, a good and taking kind of matters uh, into her own hands. Uh, another example of people in the progressive uh, movement that went outside of government uh, in order to get things done. But overall, uh, as it says here, uh, I forget which, I, I forgot to put the source here, one of the authors I've been using, the proponents of the social gospel and influential strain uh, of ref reformist Protestantism that emphasize the achievement of social justice through the active transformation of the world. They argued that the essence of Christian gospel was not in its supernatural aspects or its offer of salvation, but in its implications for social and economic reform, or uh, the, quote, Christian transformation of the social order. So the social gospel movement was of the belief that Christianity is not just about uh, achieving salvation, uh, getting into heaven, uh, understanding uh, the theology in the Bible, uh, but it's uh, also about, uh, and maybe uh, very much about, uh, Christians getting actively, actively involved in social issues and trying to bring about the betterment of their own society in the here and now. I think the overwhelming biggest success story of the progressive movement uh, and the the area where we can say almost unequivocally that the progressive movement uh, was of benefits uh, and you know, a positive uh, is the almost completely positive outcome uh, of the long difficult uphill uh, campaign for women's suffrage this uh, is one of the great success stories uh, in American history, in my view. Uh, maybe the quintessential example of how average people can get together uh, in mass uh, in a group, uh, people without power, uh, at least at first, uh, but because of solidarity uh, and strength in numbers, uh, uh, along with commitment uh, and skill and organizing and uh, uh, demonstrating uh, and getting the message out that they've achieved their goal. So the women's suffrage movement, after 72 years from start to finish, if we count the beginning uh, as 1848, uh, when the famous meeting at Seneca Falls, New York happened, which is usually seen as the kickoff uh, to the women's movement as a whole, the women's suffrage movement more specifically, if we start from there and count to 1920 when the 19th Amendment was passed, giving women the vote constitutionally nationwide. That's 72 years. So a long uphill struggle, a difficult struggle indeed, but a great success story because they achieved their goal. They stuck to it for all those decades and the women eventually got the right to vote through their own efforts primarily. So, uh, a great success story. We've seen the populists, the farmers, fail in their movement. The labor movement, not necessarily fail, but struggle mightily, making you know an inch of gain here and losing two inches uh, there. And, uh, but this uh, was successful. Now, that being said, keep in mind, this is only one of many women's issues, so it's a bit easier. I'm not taking any away from them. 
all the praise I just uh, heaped on the movement is deserved. Uh, but nonetheless, this is one issue. So uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a focused success story because uh, it's you know, going after one big issue, but an, an issue nonetheless. Uh, the, uh, I believe it's McGare says, the white suffragist leaders took innovative action to achieve results, ignoring internal disputes within the existing suffrage organizations. They launched door-to-door -door campaigns in poor and working-class neighborhoods, as well as middle and upper-class suburbs. Some activists also took the unprecedented step for women of public speaking on street corners. Uh, others won support from uh, some farm, labor, business, and professional organizations, and they lobbied state legislatures and ultimately the national government. Uh, and goes on to say, during the height of the women's suffrage campaign in the 1910s, uh, the women activists experimented with mass demonstrations, parades and pageantry, and even some bold direct, ac direct action techniques such as picketing the White House. As they moved further onto the political stage and demanded equal citizenship rights, most women activists continued to claim for themselves a kind of moral superiority based on their differences from men, insisting that women had superior insight into issues of social justice and welfare. The movement had begun uh, in the middle to late 19th century, uh, and the first generation of women's suffrage activists included the famous Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, uh, and, and they kind of took the movement the first step of the way. Both of them uh, were college-educated uh, women of middle-class background, and but they were largely able to reach out successfully only to fellow sort of middle-class Americans. And it was clear, even then, I think, that that wasn't going to be enough to, to get them over the top. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, their uh, leadership did push the uh, issue uh, clearly in the right direction. So, and the, the there were, of course, many other famous women's leaders involved in this. Uh, these might be the two most famous. And they're Professional collaboration uh, is an incredible story. Two iconic figures in history, but it's the way they worked together and the way they complemented each other uh, that made the team so potent. Not a team, literally. Uh, but just showing you the personalities uh, and drive and uh, uh, confidence of these uh, two remarkable women's leaders. In the election of 1872, Susan B. Anthony actually, and, and a number of followers, went to the local voting precinct and, and voted in that election. And women didn't have the vote anywhere in the country at that point. She just, in a sense, uh, uh, talked her way in, kind of intimidated the, you know, the, the people that were running that precinct and uh, got herself to vote. She actually got arrested afterwards uh, for doing so, uh, but she became a, a hero, certainly, in the women's movement uh, just for that action alone along with many others. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very headstrong, very uh, committed to doing things sort of the right way, which she saw as sort of the moral way. And this is one of the ways that the two complemented each other. Susan B. Anthony was a better politician. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was sort of more of a moralist in a sense, doing the right thing even to a fault. I mean to a fault in the sense that sometimes pushing full steam ahead, doing the right thing, ends up in failure if, it, if you don't have the right sort of, if it's not the right timing, uh, if the situation, uh, the context isn't lined up for it yet. So Susan B. Anthony would be the one saying, well, okay, you know, you're right. It's it's the right thing to do. But if we go full bore after this now, it's it, it probably will fail. We need to steer a, a more steady, a careful, gradual course to get what you want done. So we could do it all. We could try to do it all now. We we probably fail. Uh, a good example of the way that Stanton saw things differently and just went you know, full speed ahead, 
uh, is uh, her famous Women's Bible, published in 1895, which surely uh, Susan B. Anthony saw as a, uh, a bad idea politically, though she probably thought it was a good idea uh, in terms of you know, the, the, the principle behind it. What was the Women's Bible? Well, as edited and uh, uh, you know, uh, changed somewhat in the hands of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, it basically sort of took out the uh, misogynistic passages uh, in the Bible. So a women's Bible in the sense that it's trying to get rid of the prejudice towards women in the Bible. But Anthony, right, to, for, from her perspective, like this is a this is a disaster if we do this. If you publish that, it's going to cause us unnecessary problems. Why? Well, because at the time, most Americans uh, were Christians, and many of them church-going Christians, and this was likely to offend their religious and Christian sensibilities. So, from Anthony's point of view, uh, she's saying, this is not the right, this is going to set us back. Yeah, Owen's Bible is an interesting idea, but we're going to lose supporters that we might otherwise have. Some uh, women, maybe even you know some of their husbands, who, who might agree with what we're doing and pushing for the vote and other uh, rights that women have been deprived of for so long are going to turn against us uh, because they're going to see this as audacious uh, and right, sacrilegious and arrogant uh, of you to even try. So Anthony would be the one trying to rein in uh, the, the, the more straightforward, we're doing the right thing uh, approach uh, of Stanton. I'll skip the, the, the quotes here. You can read those on your own. Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, was one of the leading second-generation women's suffrage activists. And uh, coming from a privileged background, since her mom was famous before her, also college-educated like her mother, uh, in an era where it was still uh, not the norm for women to go to college. Uh, but she could, uh, uh, she knew how to handle herself in front of the rich and powerful, partly because she'd been around them uh, quite a bit. So, uh, and she knew that to, for the movement to be successful, for the vote to be achieved, they're going to need uh, rich women uh, uh, involved, not just the middle class women that her mother, you know, reached out to successfully, middle class women and men. So, what? why do they need rich women? Because there's only a handful of them, small percentage. Well, obviously, because they write checks, funding uh, funds for social movements like this, mass movements like this, uh, right, is always necessary to pay for marches and demonstrations, like you see here, speaking engagements, uh, etc. So, she was able to uh, use her s sort of social skills uh, to draw in uh, rich women. After all, uh, even, you know, uh, women uh, who are super rich, maybe wives of big-time corporate leaders and industrialists, uh, even they want rights uh, that they might be have been deprived of before or were deprived of before. So uh, Blatch had this uh, great influence, but she also seemed to have the common touch. Even though she came from a privileged background, she was able to successfully reach out to poor women uh, as well and recognized something that may seem obvious, but that strength in numbers, we've talked about it in the populist movement and the labor movement, but strength in numbers required reaching down to the mass of working class women from working class families and somehow getting them involved uh, and actively supporting the movement. So this then, uh, and that she was successful to some degree in doing that. So the efforts of her mother and the previous generation had brought in middle class support and Blatch and others, second generation, are sort of going up uh, above that middle class and going below the middle class to get rich uh, and working class women involved as well, plus some men. She became a politician, more or less, uh, not an elected one, but lobbied various political institutions, including Congress uh, it, it itself. Uh, so uh, she's one of the uh, leading figures uh, in making this campaign for the vote successful eventually. She said uh, in a uh, 
typical statement, perhaps someday men will raise a tablet reading in letters of gold, all honor to women, uh, the first disenfranchised class in history, who, unaided by any political party, won enfranchisement, which means voting, rights, by its own effort, and achieved the victory without the shedding of a drop of human blood. All honor to women of the world. There was a more militant wing of the suffrage movement. In fact, it's amazing that this got accomplished in this era or just on the other side of the era because at this time the women's movement was in some ways in disarray at least uh, there was a lot of divisions within the movement uh, and this is one of them Alice Paul uh, one of the uh, more talented members uh, of the you know uh, group had witnessed radical techniques uh, in Britain she was there uh, the women's activists uh, there were known for doing things as radical as chaining themselves to poles and uh, some so much more radical tactics. So she came back imbued with a more radical spirit uh, and wanted to put some of the same kind of ideas into play, uh, more militant uh, activism uh, here. Uh, for instance, uh, she led a, a counter demonstration uh, for women's suffrage, uh, a parade on the day of President Wilson's inauguration, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal to us, but that was seen as uh, by many Americans uh, as uh, outlandish. She founded a National Women's Party in 1916. Again, that you had more sort of radical uh, militant tactics. Uh, and maybe most fa uh, famously, uh, she and her silent sentinels, as they became known, started picketing the White House uh, with signs and uh, in front of the White House demanding the right to vote, even during World War I, which uh, made her even uh, more controversial. She said, there will never be a, war a new world order until women are a part of it. So she disagreed with some of the other leaders, mainstream leaders, uh, particularly uh, Kerry Chapman Catt, who we'll see next. But nonetheless, uh, she helped to, to move the ball forward. As much as the others may have denounced her for kind of going her own way, it can be argued, I think, that having this kind of friction and different approaches uh, actually worked uh, to the benefit uh, of you know, the ultimate goal, which was achieving the vote. Kat was a longtime activist, became president of the most important, but not the only uh, women's organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1915. Uh, she helped increase its membership through her skilled leadership uh, to over 2 million uh, members uh, and initiated what became known as the Winning Plan, uh, coordinating uh, local, state, national uh, efforts uh, and the overall goal being the adoption of women's suffrage, uh, an amendment for women's suffrage in the Constitution within four years. So she sort of helped to organize things uh, much more carefully uh, and skillfully uh, set sort of timelines uh, and uh, specific goals. And uh, it's usually argued that she's uh, maybe the, the, the primary leader uh, in getting sort of uh, you know to the goalpost and across. By the way, uh, one issue that we should raise, World War I posed a huge challenge uh, for the women's suffrage movement because by World War I, the, the war broke out in 1914. The U.S. didn't get involved until 1917. But once it did, it put the women's movement in a bind because uh, up until this time, one of the arguments, only one, there were others, that women made for why they should have the right to vote and the right to run for office and you know hold public office is that women mainly I guess because of their uh, you know child rearing uh, sort of biological connection to children were not as aggressive uh, not as sort of competitive as men and so it'd be kind of a kinder gentler world if women voted and if women are involved in politics whether that's true or not is beside the point it's an argument that they were making uh, to try to get women and men uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, support uh, uh, the cause. And some of the women's leaders, 
uh, had sort, sort of gone so far uh, in this direction that they'd come out against war, not specific war, some of them had come out against war period, come out as pacifists. So when the war began, or when the United States got involved in the war anyway, this became a, a fear uh, uh, among uh, women's leaders, supporters of the movement, because it was unclear what their stance was going to be on World War I. And there was disagreement here. Alice Paul uh, kind of went her own way, as she often did. But the mainstream of the movement decided, and, and this was the right decision, if the goal was to achieve the vote sooner rather than later, as soon as possible, they made the right decision. Uh, but there was some debate about it. What the women's movement, at least the mainstream part of it, did was not only uh, put the women's suffrage campaign on hold as long as the war was still going on, but they actually used their resources, time and energy, organizing skills to work for the war effort uh, uh, to uh, make themselves look as patriotic as possible. Not that they weren't patriotic, but they're, uh, they recognized that the, the public relations here, uh, you know, is going to be much better for them if they're going along uh, and supporting the war uh, and putting their other goals for the time being on the back burner uh, than if they continue to push for the vote uh, in the middle of a world war. So they looked more patriotic. Uh, and this was especially likely to uh, bring men on board supporting their cause uh, or keep them on board. Uh, some men uh, were already convinced uh, that it was the right thing to do for women to have the vote, to the hold office, and not supporting the war or, you know, not supporting it 100% would probably have lost them a lot of support, uh, particularly of men who, you know, were already supporting them and then thought, uh, what, they're not supporting the war? Uh, you know, that, that, that now makes me, I don't mean me, but a guy talking to himself or someone else, that makes me question now their uh, a commitment to the country uh, and whether or not they should be actively involved in politics, whether at the voting booth or in a, uh, you know, an elected office, uh, because they don't seem to see, uh, uh, at least uh, you know, a number of them, a lot of them, uh, how important uh, it is sometimes to uh, use military force. Although whether or not the United States should have been involved in World War One, we'll see or talk about in the next unit. So we now get uh, to the last section of the unit, uh, and we're going to take a brief look at the Roosevelt administration uh, and then the Wilson administration. We're skipping the administration of William Howard Taft, another progressive president uh, in between, who served only one term. Taft, in my view, is an underrated president, but the textbooks don't talk about him too much. Uh, so, And for reasons of time, then I'm going to kind of leave him by the wayside as well. Theodore Roosevelt, as we have already seen to some degree uh, in his role in American foreign policy, both before being president and uh, while president uh, with the Great White Fleet, uh, the Roosevelt Corollary, the Panama Canal, uh, and so forth, was a dynamo of energy. Uh, Roosevelt was just a, an outsized, uh, a larger than life personality. Uh, he was extremely good uh, with the public. The teddy bear, right? Uh, teddy Roosevelt, uh, named after him. He's kind of had a bear-like uh, visage and sort of frame and uh, endeared himself to the American public, but was in a very, very active uh, person. A uh, very uh, engaging personality, very outgoing personality, uh, and just somebody that didn't stop. Had a ton of ideas. He wrote books. He was an intellectual. Uh, you know, was a, had been a good uh, student, uh, but loved sort of the rough and tumble of politics, uh, and had so many ideas, and was just a, a you know a brimming uh, with ideas. Uh, plus the the gumption uh, and the drive, and the ambition, the desire, uh, the energy uh, to go get things done. He was a go-getter. Uh, and he helped to turn the presidency 
uh, into a more powerful office. Uh, we said this about Wilson early in the unit, uh, but it's also true of Roosevelt. Uh, the two of them, both progressive presidents of different parties, set the tone for an increasing, uh, increasingly active presidency, uh, the imperial presidency, as I called it before. So, uh, speaking of Roosevelt, Wilfred McClay in Land of Hope says, an activist, he could not see any reason to refrain from using the powers of government to make life better. So, laissez-faire capitalism uh, did not appeal to him, nor, uh, though did socialism, which he distrusted, he distrusted as excessively radical. A balance between these two positions the, uh, was necessary. Uh, that balance included an expansive and vigorous view of the presidency uh, in which the president would set the legislative agenda for Congress. The activist power of the presidency had been relatively dormant since the death of Lincoln on the rise of Congressional Reconstruction, which we've already talked about at the beginning of the class. Roosevelt would seek to restore it. So remember that Gilded Age presidents hadn't uh, been active really at all. Uh, the, the presidency went into decline to some degree, at least in terms of its assertiveness between Lincoln and Roosevelt. So Roosevelt's the first guy that kind of steps uh, 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 to the fore, forefront uh, and says, no, the, the presidency is the premier position uh, in government, which we take as a matter of course today, but that's only because it started here uh, and, and continued to build up momentum uh, uh, you know, through the through this century and into our century uh, today, so the presidency hadn't been seen in this regard. The framers of the Constitution back in 1787 had seen the legislative branch, the Congress, as Im just as important as, and should, uh, and in their view, should have just as much power. A few exceptions at the convention, uh, and there were a few, like James Madison probably the most influential of all uh, of the makers of the Constitution, who believed that the legislative power should be more important, uh, more powerful than the executive or the president. So uh, Roosevelt disagreed uh, and is the first since Lincoln to then really use the presidency in a much, uh, uh, in a very active, uh, sort of dominant way. In Lincoln's case, uh, it was a matter of necessity because the country had just split and two, when he came to office, partially because of him coming to office, uh, uh, the southern states seceding from the Union and starting a, a civil war. So Lincoln, in some ways, I think, was a reluctant uh, a person to wield uh, great executive authority. But nonetheless, uh, he did so. And uh, Roosevelt uh, is sort of the next president uh, to do so. So been the first in a, in a, in a long while. Mark Hanna. Uh, politician, businessman we've already met, the guy who managed William McKinley's uh, campaign, who knew Roosevelt uh, and didn't get along with him very well, uh, talked at one point in a famous uh, statement uh, about uh, that damned cowboy is now president. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, wasn't a cowboy. He came from, remember, a, a background with a silver spoon in his mouth, a, a old money uh rich family from New York, but there's sort of two ways in which that Hannah quote is accurate. One is that he, this is typical of Roosevelt, uh, this this guy that just loved to uh, be active and engaged in, in life and politics in every way possible. Uh, before he was president, he moved out to, was it Montana, somewhere in the West, uh, and did a stint as a sort of a cattle rancher, cowboy. It ended up being unsuccessful in the end, uh, but he stayed committed to it for quite for quite some time and even earned the respect of some of the real cowboys that were out there. This is a guy, you know, a kid that had been born with a silver spoon in his mouth uh, that did this voluntarily, uh, but he loved the idea of adventure uh, and uh, sort of danger and getting involved in it. Uh, remember, he had kind of a little kid's approach to war, uh, loved being involved in the Spanish-American War, uh, so uh, he actually is known for going on safari hunts in Africa, something we would generally look down upon today. 
but uh, this is the kind of uh, life of excitement and, and drama and adventure uh, and sort of uh, always being active uh, that is typical uh, of Roosevelt's personality. Uh, so that damned cowboy as president uh, uh, is true in, in that sense, but he had kind of a cowboy's mentality uh, in his overall kind of just sort of pushing forward, uh, right, to all the time, moving, uh, you know, uh, uh, forward uh, with um, ambitious goals that he put into action as much as he possibly could. N not without thought. He wasn't just blindly, uh, you know, uh, pushing the envelope, uh, being blindly and recklessly aggressive. Uh, his ideas, policies were well thought out. Uh, he, he just believed in pushing them hard. So, uh, we'll, we'll see an example of this in a minute. His square deal, as he called it, uh, a package of legislation, which, by the way, uh, made him the first president in history to name his whole slate of legislation, uh, to, to give it a label and a name. Others would follow New Deal, his distant cousin Franklin Roosevelt's packet uh, of uh, reforms and laws. Uh, New Freedom, Wilson, we'll see next. Square Deal was Harry Truman later on. So Roosevelt was the first to kind of use this marketing scheme of sorts uh, uh, to uh, give at least the appearance of coherence, uh, if not the actuality, uh, to uh, legislation. The anthracite coal strike in 1902, uh, famous uh, legislative achievement, uh, or I, would, I should say presidential achievement, Northern Securities case, a, a judicial achievement, but done by... Uh, the president uh, and his administration, the Hepburn Act, the Meat and Spatchkin Acts, which were legislation which he uh, uh, supported and signed into law. Uh, Roosevelt is a great uh, source of quotes, historical quotes. Uh, uh, he's just eminently quotable. He said, nothing in the world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. I've never in my life envied a human being who lived an easy life. That, and again, that's quintessential uh, uh, Roosevelt. That's right out of the Roosevelt playbook. Uh, uh, that wasn't an exaggeration. That wasn't him being phony. That this is the way this guy lived, uh, and this was his, uh, uh, you know, part of his philosophy uh, of life. Roosevelt is known uh, and was known at the time uh, as a trust buster. Uh, meaning that he, he had he developed a reputation, which he still holds to some degree today, as a guy who didn't trust corporations. He, he wasn't wild about capitalists. Came from an old money family. He saw capitalists as kind of gauche, new money uh, uh, people, as old money folks often do, uh, which might have been part of the reason that he uh, sort of went after uh, corporate leaders, business leaders, at least some of the time. Trust buster meant that you know. On behalf of the public, defending the public, uh, he went after uh, corporations who he believed, at least at times, were gouging the public or ripping them off or, or harming them and one another. So uh, he had a reputation for standing up to big business. The question I have here uh, is, does he deserve that reputation as a trust buster? And I think the answer is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that he did stand up to corporations uh, at times no, in the sense that the reputation makes it look like that's what he did all the time truth be told he picked his battles carefully and he didn't uh, he, he didn't take on or compete with all corporations not even most of them he picked his battles carefully uh, but he did pick some battles with them which is more than we can say about any of the Gilded Age presidents uh, and you can see it here uh, in the conflict uh, between Roosevelt and none other than J.P. Morgan. And yes, I've set up those two pictures to look like they're uh, pointing at each other. They're not, but uh, it's a great job by me, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, I do. I do like this. Uh, but uh, this uh, was part of the Northern Securities case, as it became known. Uh, and J.P. Morgan was used to Gilded Age presidents 
who, remember, came to him for favors, came to him and begged him to help, uh, you know, in one financial crisis, economic crisis after another. So he was used to the government sort of begging him uh, uh, for favors. And this guy was of a different, you know, made from a different uh, a cloth. Uh, uh, so uh, Roosevelt, that is. So Roosevelt found out that early in his presidency that Morgan and a number of railroad operators were trying to put together a trust, right? a gigantic monopoly railroad that would have basically united the railroads uh, of much of the East Coast with the Midwest and Chicago. It would have been a gigantic enterprise. And there was already antitrust law uh, on the books, the Sherman Antitrust Law of 1890, and Roosevelt asked his attorney general to look into it, Philander Knox, Knox came back and said, if we go after uh, this and prosecute Morgan and the other uh, interests here, uh, I guarantee you a victory. And so Roosevelt uh, gave him the go-ahead to do it, uh, and they took this case eventually uh, to court uh, and broke up the national, uh, the, the Northern Securities uh, Trust arrangement. But when Morgan was first confronted with this, he actually said, as you see, send your man to see my man and tell him to fix it up. Uh, it's basically, this is the President of the United States, but this is what Morgan was used to. He's used to dictating to the presidents, not the other way around. So, it, it, this is a kind of a blow-off statement, blowing the President off. Like, well, okay, you got a problem, I, I'm too busy for this, I'll send one of my guys, and you can send one of your guys, they can kind of work it out and let me know what happens, but I gotta, you know, I gotta go. Uh, Roosevelt responded, that cannot be done. Nobody treats as a sovereign equal to the president. Uh, no company can presume to be, no private interest can presume to be equal to the government. The government must be superior to all of these. So, and this, again, must have come as a shock uh, to Morgan, uh, that he just was not used to a, a president uh, that was this forceful and this willing uh, to take on somebody as big and powerful and wealthy as Morgan. It's as if Roosevelt was saying, there's a new sheriff in town, Mr. Morgan. Uh, right? Uh, things aren't going to be done the old way. You're not going to be in the driver's seat any longer. I am. Some of this was his own political philosophy. Some of it, I think, was Roosevelt's own personality, uh, which was a competitive, forceful personality, to be sure. The anthracite coal strike is a good example uh, of how he deserves, at least in part, his reputation as a trust buster. Now, this wasn't the breaking up of a trust, but it does show his propensity to get involved in uh, labor activity and business activity on the side of labor uh, and uh, confronting a big business. So there was a massive coal strike before the winter of 1902. So there was great fear uh in Americans, uh, you know, hearts and minds, as well as the presidents, that if that many coal miners in the tens of thousands are out on strike when the winter comes, coal was a major source of uh, heating of homes, that people are going to freeze to death. So this is going to cause huge problems. So this is part of the impetus for Roosevelt to get involved. And get involved he did, which was unprecedented. Uh, there was no official uh, role for a president to play in, a, in our capitalist system when there's a strike, when there's a, a dispute between labor on one side, unions and workers, and owners and management of the company and an industry on another side. But what he did, again informally because there was no formal mechanism, was call both sides together uh, and to sort of get them to meet with him. So he put himself in the middle as the informal mediator. They could have said no, I suppose, but it was the President of the United States. Uh, they, if they think fairly quickly, uh, understood who he was and what kind of guy he was. So you better not say no to him. Uh, he could make it worse for you. But when they did come together, and he tried to kind of help them negotiate, make compromises, when he saw that the coal industry owners and managers, negotiators, uh, uh, proved reluctant uh, to make compromises. Uh, the labor leaders, uh, he thought, were more amenable. Uh, he threatened to nationalize the coal mines. And he meant to only temporarily, but he didn't necessarily say that, uh, and he certainly 
uh, must have feared that this could be permanent. Nationalizing an industry, the coal mines in this case, means the government will take it over. So what he's saying is if, if you owners of coal mines, you multimillionaire you know, business owners, if you don't make some sort of compromise settlement the workers can and will accept, then I'll send the U.S. military to co the mine the coal so the public doesn't freeze to death in the winter, and you guys can go out of business, at least for the time being. Now, however many months uh, that would have been, right, that would have been millions uh, of losses uh, for the corporations. So this does seem to have... Uh, you know, jolted them uh, to attention, uh, and sure enough, a compromise settlement was offered uh, and achieved. So it is a great example of Roosevelt, uh, at least on some occasions, being a trust buster. He didn't do this all the time. As I said, he picked his battles carefully, but uh, when he acted, he did so with great resolve and, and great force. Professor Rourke, our beloved uh, textbook author, says, observing Roosevelt in action, Joseph Pulitzer, great media mogul, remarked, he has subjugated Wall Street. Pulitzer exaggerated, uh, but Roosevelt had masterfully asserted the moral and political authority of the executive, underscoring in his words, the duty of the president to act upon the theory that he is the steward of the people. In his handling of the anthracite coal strike in 1902, the strike we just mentioned, Roosevelt again demonstrated his willingness to assert the authority of the presidency this time to mediate between labor and management. That we've already uh, talked about. But uh, so you can see this in two ways, uh, right? To Roosevelt as doing the right thing uh, and something uh, that worked out uh, fairly uh, for the coal, the, the coal miners themselves, who were the ones really under you know uh, distress, not the owners of the company uh, themselves, so that he's doing the right thing. He's using his office, the presidency, uh, to do something morally uh, 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 correct. On the other hand, you could say uh, that this is what critics of the progressive era uh, tend to say uh, about these kind of uh, issues, that Roosevelt uh, was using his office uh, right uh, uh, recklessly, uh, going beyond its constitutional mandate, uh, because, again, there's nothing in the Constitution that says the president is supposed to mediate strikes and put pressure on uh, the owners of businesses uh, to make uh, you know uh, fair uh, and you know uh, amenable settlements uh, to their to their workers, so uh, this can cut in both directions. But Roosevelt uh, certainly backed up uh, his words on on more than one occasion. This is just one big example. The Northern Securities case is actually another one. In 1912, there was a presidential election of great consequence. Uh, which uh, couldn't be sort of seen as the new nationalism uh, against the new freedom. Uh, new freedom being uh, the phrase uh, that Woodrow Wilson and his campaign uh, came up with for his uh, slate of progressive legislation. Uh, but Roosevelt, uh, who'd by 1912 been out of office uh, for four years and had been succeeded by uh, one of his uh, advisors, William Howard Taft, uh, was, was for a number of reasons not happy uh, with Taft's performance as a re fellow Republican president, and so he decided to get uh, throw his hat back into the ring again. Remember, Roosevelt had only been elected to the presidency once. Uh, his uh, first number of years was serving out most of the second term of uh, William McKinley, uh, who got uh, killed, uh, assassinated uh, early on. So Roosevelt technically still... Uh, uh, could uh, run again and and not violate George Washington's precedent, not president, but Washington set a precedent after retiring from the White House, from the presidency, after two, two terms. There wasn't a constitutional amendment yet prohibiting a president from running for uh, office uh, more than two times, but everybody respected the precedent uh, and Roosevelt thought, well, I, I'm, I'd still be respecting the precedent if I ran again, because I only ran once, uh, which I think was true. Uh, but it was somewhat, uh, it, it, it was, uh, you know, a strange situation. He, but he was defeated by Taft uh, in uh, the Republican primary. Incumbent presidents uh, usually have an advantage, particularly in primaries. 
but since it was Theodore Roosevelt, a very popular president with the public, uh, uh, to be sure, I haven't talked about it too much, but he really was, uh, it is somewhat surprising that he didn't get the nomination. But when he didn't, instead of stepping aside, he decided to run as a third-party candidate uh, and help to form the new Progressive Party, uh, not surprisingly named, uh, or uh, its nickname, the Bull Moose Party, and ran uh, as a third-party candidate. Woodrow Wilson was the Democratic nominee uh, on the other side. We've already talked a little bit about his meteoric rise uh, to the top. And not insignificantly, Eugene V. Debs, uh, right, the labor leader uh, that uh, went to prison after the Pullman strike failed and was increasingly becoming a socialist, got 6% of the vote in 1912, running as a Socialist Party candidate. 6% sounds like not very much, but considering it was the reviled socialism uh, that uh, he represented, it's amazing that he got 6%. Uh, he ran a few other times for president as well. But Wilson won the nomination and won the presidency. The numbers don't indicate that it was the split right between Taft and Roosevelt that allowed Wilson to win since Taft and Roosevelt you know, drew votes away from each other, uh, not, from Wilson, not from Wilson. But I think it did have a, a, a negative impact or a positive impact on Wilson's uh, chances of winning, even if not numerically, uh, or at least not seen uh, in, in the numbers. Nonetheless, uh, this election then put Woodrow Wilson, a progressive Democrat, in the White House. Uh, and we've already talked a little bit uh, I sort of set this up uh, at the beginning uh, about how Wilson changed uh, the presidency, uh, deliberately so, and in a sense forever. Roosevelt did so to some degree as well, but Wilson uh, definitely even more so. Uh, he actually said at one point that the president should be as big a man as he can, uh, right? Try to be as big a man as he can, meaning the president should assert himself as, uh, you know, the power in government as much as possible. He didn't mean become a dictator, uh, but within the democratic process, he should push, you know, for as much power for himself as, as possible. Uh, again, his new freedom uh, was the, the name he used for his slate of legislation, which you see there is quite uh, big. But was his viewpoint consistent with uh, American conceptions of liberty going all the way back to the founding generation and the framing of the Constitution? Uh, that's uh, a little unclear and certainly arguable. Uh, Wilson, again, is a very consequential, pre consequential president, both in domestic policy, which we're talking about here, and foreign policy, which we'll see in the next unit. Uh, influential doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, you know, good or bad. It just means having a, a, a huge impact. And it's you know, arguable, as so much here is. Uh, but among conservatives uh, today, particularly uh, among uh, libertarians, who aren't necessarily conservative, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, he's often the most reviled president of them all. Uh, and it doesn't take much, I think, to see why. Uh, right, uh, the Sixteenth Amendment to the Constitution uh, is uh, the amendment that brought in income tax uh, as a permanent feature uh, of American society, American life. Nobody likes to be taxed, and people weren't wild about the income tax. Uh, and uh, so, this is one of the reasons he's hated by libertarians today who think taxation, income tax, is too much government intrusion. Uh, into Americans' uh, individual personal lives and, you know, uh, taking their money from them uh, as they see it. Uh, also, the Federal Reserve System in 1913, which basically brought back a national bank for the United States, which we still have even now, uh, also anathema to libertarians today and to anti-progressives, uh, you know, at the time. So, uh, Wilson certainly was responsible for uh, many uh, controversial uh, laws, uh, in this, amendments to the Constitution, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, institutions that he established, like the Federal Reserve. So, uh, his new freedom 
certainly was progressive in, in, in certain ways, as Rivers and Harbors Act, Federal uh, Farm Loan uh, Act program, Wild Game Refuge Act, I think that was 1914 as well, uh, but uh, uh, controversial nonetheless. Uh, Leonard, again, an illiberal reformers, I love the title, uh, says, Government, Wilson said, was a living organism, accountable to Darwin, not Newton, as we already know. That, that phrase is uh, worth repeating. Remember, uh, Darwin about evolution, Newton about fixed laws. So uh, they were talking about science and nature. He's applying it to government, saying we, we can't be like Newton and laws of gravity, which stay the same even as societies and the world changes. We have to be like uh, uh, Darwin, uh, uh, Darwinistic evolution, society uh, and government has to change along with society. A government he says, must be free to adapt to its times. The adaptation Wilson had in mind was to neutralize Congress and consolidate power in a vigorous executive, meaning the presidency. Uh, government was weak and slow because its powers were divided, being divided between checks and balances. Cong Congress has power alongside the president, Supreme Court, states, etc., and it lacked the leadership of a commanding executive. Uh, and this, again, to many people, even now, I think, sounds good. Uh, the progressives uh, loved it then. Uh, but uh, I think we should at least pause here uh, and recognize that th this does have uh, uh, controversial implications. This president is saying, we should put more power in my hands, in the presidency's hands. And he believed this philosophically, uh, not just you know, as a way to grab power for himself. He believed it was the right way to make government work, but he's making government work in a sense by moving away from uh, democracy, or at least moving away from legislative uh, power uh, and uh, making that connection between the president uh, and the public, going directly to the public and kind of doing an in run around uh, you know, uh, elective institutions. So uh, one can argue, critics have then, and still do now, uh, that this was uh, dangerous, uh, that he's, uh, he's too much trying to mess with a system that was designed from the beginning to keep uh, too much power out of one person's hands, and his philosophy is, no, we have to put more power uh, into the hands of the president, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the president must act uh, in a way uh, that's beneficial to the people, uh, and uh, he does that when he sort of you know adapts to the times and changes things according to what's necessary to adapt to those times. In a, a really good recent book uh, on the history of the presidency called "The Lost Soul of the American Presidency," the uh, scholar says that wrote it says. Woodrow Wilson was one of the most significant chief executives in the history of the American presidency. Wilson built on Roosevelt's activism, meaning Roosevelt's own tendency to uh, take more power uh, uh, you know, onto the presidency itself, and bestowed it with an intellectual imprimatur that influenced the thinking of presidential practitioners as well as scholarly observers for decades to come. Wilson's interpretation of presidential power became gospel within the ranks of the Democratic Party. Uh, he was the president who launched the activist presidency, which persists to this day. So that that I save that for last because Stephen Knott I think sums uh, up the sentiment very well uh, that Wilson basically in invented the activist presidency, where the president sort of takes uh, more and more of the reins of uh, government uh, unto himself, uh, and uh, he really believed that it was best for the public. But I think the last thing maybe to point out here is that there's an arrogance behind this because it's basically saying, I know best, uh, listen to me, uh, we don't really need to have power spread out and checks and balances because I'm I'm doing this for the good of the public, and I know what's good for the public. So just trust me and follow me, and I'll kind of lead you, uh, in, you know, to the to the right to the right place. For any one person to sort of know what's right for everybody else, 
is questionable, uh, uh, and it, it it just seems to be pushing uh, power uh, sort of uh, uh, to dangerous levels in a system that was do designed to spread out power uh, in a democratic uh, uh, system, uh, sense uh, to try to avoid uh, tyranny uh, and other problems. So Wilson uh, was a brilliant uh, and gifted individual but there are some uh, I think uh, red flags about his presidency in the next unit we'll see uh, what those red flags were when it comes to his foreign policy thank you